excited by the oh <laughs> the amazing teacher Paulo Gomes Ribeiro and the researcher uh, João Francisco and uh, both my my colleagues and whom I thank once again the invitation to chair this session and uh, I just wanted to give some quick info uh, before we start and I'm going to switch for Portuguese just for uh, a moment. Uh, portanto, esta sessão vai ser toda em português, ok? Portanto, ah, em português, em inglês, portanto, se alguém uh, tiver alguma dúvida, uh, se quiser colocar uma questão e tem alguma dificuldade ou não se sinta muito à vontade, pode enviar a mensagem no, no chat que depois posso uh, traduzir. E também há a opção de pôr a transcrição ao vivo. O Zoom tem essa opção e funciona bem para o inglês. Se houver traduções esquisitas, está cada uma ao seu cargo, mas... Uh, vai ser todo em inglês, se houver alguma dúvida podem entrar em contato comigo ou, ou com a professora Paula ou com o João que, que, para ajudarmos. And so back to, to English. Um, so as, as you know, uh, we are in Zoom, so Zoom has an etiquette, so please, if you all can, keep your cameras off and your microphones muted during each talk. And then after each talk, if you can, and if you want, please turn on your camera so that uh, we can still feel that we're all here and give this collective feeling, even though we're virtually uh, meeting. And, uh, um, and also all the questions will be uh, gathered uh, after the three talks. So uh, if you have a very quick question or a, a doubt after each paper, you can just put it on chat or raise your hand via Zoom to, to put that question out loud. But uh, if not, if you if you can, please leave all the questions for the end of the panel so that we can do like a very collective uh, discussion and keep the connections between each paper uh, really uh, lit. Um, and so, yeah, so this session is called uh, Music Videos Between Sound and Image. And I think it's quite clear what it's about. And I think uh, we should start already. We have three wonderful panelists with us today. So Michael Goddard, Jean Ricardo and Annika Kampman. And so we're going to start with Michael. I'm going to do a brief presentation of each um, author before their own talk. So Dr. Michael is reader in film, television, and moving image at the University of Westminster. He has published widely on international cinema and audiovisual culture, as well as cultural media theory. In media archaeology, his most significant contribution is the monograph Guerrilla Networks, which was published by the Amsterdam University Press. And he's previous book, Impossible Cartographies, was on the cinema of Raul Ruiz. And now he is currently working on a book on the British post-industrial group COIL and a new research project on genealogies of immersive media and virtuality. And he's going to talk to us about um, today, Sincere, Authentic, Remediated, the Effective Labor of Music Video Reaction Videos on YouTube. So whenever you can, Michael, you can start and thank you. Okay, so I just want to thank all the organizers and the organizers of this work group for accepting my paper. This is a totally new area of research for me, which I find really uh, quite fascinating. So I hope you'll find it interesting as well. Uh, it's pretty far removed from COIL, um, but I'm still wearing a t-shirt. Um, just, uh, just to uh, get started, um, basically this sort of began in a sense with a playlist. I just put it in the chat. So I'd really encourage you to open that. Uh, you maybe won't be able to play it during my talk, but hopefully you can play it afterwards. I was going to play some clips from the playlist, but I don't think we would have time. So, uh, yeah, so please do do look, have, do down, you know, do upload that and look at that uh, later on. Um, I won't show it to you now because it's obvious it's a, it's a YouTube playlist, uh, but I thought that was also kind of an appropriate way of dealing with material that I'm talking about. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I'll open my PowerPoint. So you all see that? You can see that? Yes, yes, everything's cool, yes. Okay. Okay, so, um, so like, comment, and subscribe. So begins almost every reaction video on YouTube, which collectively constitute a strange ecology of effective labor and cultural translation that merits further attention. 
Well, there have been several studies of the free of free labor of user, the free labor of user activities on digital and social media platforms. Reaction videos are different, as if successful, these channels are potentially a source of income through advertising, monetization, as well as in most cases, Patreon subscriptions that give subscribers extra rights to request content. Um, Okay, so it's just a sort of an introduction to that kind of thing. And you can see some merch from the J show on the right. The videos themselves involve intros followed by acts of listening and viewing of a range of music videos and other content. While it's impossible to fully characterize all the genres and eras involved, it's frequently historical material from the late 20th or early 21st century, material being processed largely coming from various forms of rock, punk, metal, indie, new wave, and other forms of often, but not always, white music genres. While there's also considerable diversity among reactors in terms of ethnicity, gender, age, and relations to different popular music styles, there's been a recent tendency towards young African-American uh, or other black reactors, often but not necessarily coming from backgrounds in hip hop, R&B, and pop music, but branching out well beyond these in their reactions. Um, so, and the effective labor of reactors, therefore, is not only in performing a sincere uh, reaction to the archival material, but also translating it in various ways to a new and often very different time period and cultural context. This can range from the descriptive to the extremely personal, from comments on the energy, beauty, and power of performances to the meanings or meaninglessness of song lyrics. The framings of these responses in terms of everything from video intros to the mise-en-scene of the reactor space and use of costume and makeup also play an essential role in the various styles of these responses. So this paper is going to um, will engage with sev several of these channels, including um, that's just the outline that we're going to follow, including um, the J Show, India Reacts, Pink Metalhead, K and Livy, and Anoma to track how these reactors perform acts of media and cultural translation, enabled but also constrained by the algorithmically determined affordances of a YouTube platform. It will interrogate how this work of listening, understanding, and feeling operates a kind of prosthesis for the subscriber by means of which they're able to re-experience familiar musical material with fresh ears and eyes and look at a range of effective listening experiences enacted by the reactors. We'll finally ask, especially given the context of COVID-19 social distancing, how the often addictive experience of reaction videos constitutes a kind of substitute sociality, allowing for highly mediated performances of sincerity and authenticity and constructing utopian relationships between subjects who might otherwise have little in common. And I'm not really going to go into it, but also a lot of these reactors do live sessions as well, or special videos that they make to talk about uh, their channels uh, in addressing, you know, subscribers and viewers directly uh, and so forth. And so, you know, and very much speak of what they're doing in terms of community and family and so forth. Okay, and this just gives you an idea of some of the reactors and the sort of numbers of subscribers we're talking about. They're not like the most popular reactors that that, that there are, but these are, uh, are pretty, you know, pretty regular posters of reaction videos and with, you know, pretty, pretty large numbers of subscribers, um, as you can see. Okay, so as indicated in the title, reaction videos are definitely instances of remediation, um, but ones that combine multiple, multiple layers of of digital remediation. So music videos themselves are already a remediation of popular music, and they're like further remediated by appearing on social media and therefore already in, you know, potentially subject to, you know, to commenting, uh, modification, you know, mashups, uh, all those kinds of things, sharing and so forth. Um, but reaction videos add another layer to this, which neither corresponds to conventional discussions of user generated content, mashups or other social media phenomena. Reactors do not attempt to modify the content they react to and instead tend to show the utmost respect, treating the sometimes arbitrary combination of music and visuals as an integral whole to be felt and engaged with exegetically by intuitive interpretations or even reading out the lyrics. However, this inevitably takes place in a hypermediated form in that reaction videos consist of two windows, a large one usually of a reactor and a smaller one of the material reacted to. This has several uh, determinations, both technical and economic, since owners of original content will often make claims against its remediation, especially if this might be profitable to reactors rather than the proprietary companies. And YouTube uh, also responds uh, in various ways um, 
to these claims, from taking down videos to eliminating the audio or video content to even stopping reactors from uploading uh, further material through copyright strikes. While some of these issues will be engaged with, the focus of the paper, however, will be more on reaction videos in terms of effective labor, which requires a little bit further introduction. So as I said, you know, the sort of free labor paradigm has been used a lot to talk about people's, you know, activities online for which they're, you know, usually not kind of really compensated, even though you're they're creating value for a lot of, you know, uh, companies like Facebook or YouTube or whatever the platform might be. Um, but uh, reaction videos are, are something slightly different, as I indicated. So the authors of a 2014 study on the creation of uh, user-generated content around music videos identified a range of possible remediations, including covers, remixes, parodies, dancing, and flash mobs, as well as reactions. Interestingly enough, in 2014, it was the first four of these that were most prevalent, and the numbers of reaction videos across multiple genres was uh, actually negligible. Um, while these types of of UGC remain popular, I suspect that reaction videos have now taken a much more prominent place on YouTube and some genres of user-generated content have migrated to other platforms like TikTok, obviously for dancing and so forth. Whatever the case, there's certainly been a resurgence of reaction videos over the last few years, especially during the period of COVID lockdowns, as well as responses to these phenomena uh, in mainstream media outlets. So that's a very famous example of this was a recent article uh, from last year um, in Rolling Stone about uh, about YouTube reaction videos. So our um, reaction video is yet another example of of user generated content as free labor. And what kind of labor are we talking about? Um, my hypothesis is that this labor corresponds to free labor in the sense that nobody would choose it primarily as a way of making money, uh, yet the economy behind these videos is more complex than simply being further free advertising for popular music industries. YouTube channels, if they have enough subscribers, can be monetized and their possibilities for their creators can make money through advertising. Furthermore, creators frequently also have Patreon or similar accounts where subscribers can directly pay in order to receive benefits, like their requests going to the front of a queue which is not insignificant when popular channels might have between 80,000 and 250,000 or more subscribers. Through these back-end architectures, reactors can also sell merchandise, as I've mentioned, from clothing to headphones. Pink Metalhead, for example, makes videos of her exercise routines and clothing try-ons available to paid subscribers, while Kay and Livy claim to be using paid requests for songs for a GoFundMe fund to build their own house. Um, but what value um, are reactors adding that might encourage subscribers to invest in their various brands. This is where notions of sincerity and authenticity come in, as well as a complex economy of effective labor. Where subscribers request reactions to material they already know, and in many cases have strong fandom relationships to, reactors usually claim to have never heard the music before, or at least only in passing in a film or on the radio. So what subscribers are paying for, whether economically or just in terms of investing time and attention in the channel, is a first time and therefore authentic reaction to a piece of music and or video that they know and love, but which they, in most cases is no longer fresh or, fresh or new for them. For their part, reactors are intuitive archaeologists following the suggestions of the subscribers for a variety of explicit motives from uh, keeping music alive, as Jamel, aka Jamal says, to going on a music journey, as India Reacts says, or being an emotional empath who enjoys heavy metal and twerking, as Pink Metalhead says. Um, or some other version of an expressed love for music and a desire to extend their musical experience via the socially networked assemblage. Paradoxically, this authenticity needs to be performed, usually through emotional and visceral response, some examples of which we'll examine soon. While some reactors may just bop along to the music and give some indication whether or not they like it, many of the reactors are more performative and visibly embody a range of effective and energetic responses to these acts of listening. In one of the few articles on the emotional labor of these reaction videos to date, this is summed up as follows as embodying varying layers of reactivity. So basically this idea of reactivity, as you can see here uh, in the quote, is that um, on the one hand, you know, reactors are kind of heightening their, their, their physical, visceral experience of music, music media, uh, and they, they basically treat their individual sensitivity to music as an asset, giving them unparalleled access to music's power. Um, 
So it's kind of something like an asset or skill, being able to respond or, or react to music sort of in the moment, uh, which yields profit, visibility, and authority for them as listeners. And secondly, reactivity describes their goals for creating these videos, which creators hope will, will provoke subsequent reactors among viewers and subscribers. So reaction videos ideally create more reactions. Um, so reactions, you know, we can understand these reaction videos, therefore, as this kind of complex, effective chain reaction from the suggestions of subscribers to reactors, and then from the reactors through performative acts of listening uh, to the viewers' listeners, thereby encouraging them to react to the channel by supporting it through likes and subscriptions and making comments, etc., if not financial support. However, despite the name reaction videos, I'd see this more in terms of responsiveness and reactivity, the responsive capacities of these performative acts of listening, generating feelings, meaning, and value for subscribers, and constituting not only an effective economy, but also a mode of sociality that may explain the exponential increase of reaction videos during the period of COVID lockdowns. So in what remains of the uh, paper, um, I'd like to look at a couple of different uh, examples, uh, but do this through uh, through different kinds of ethics rather than say music genres or even by looking at sort of one channel, uh, one channel at a time. And just to, uh, if you'll notice in the playlist, um, just to point out that uh, there are other forms of kind of reaction to music that exist on YouTube. So on one hand, you get kind of organized reactions like the React channel, which will have, you know, teenagers listen to My Chemical Romance or adults listen to or elders or children, uh, et cetera. But it's all very carefully sort of arranged and organized. Um, or you get the sort of expert reactors who are doing more, more of a kind of review function, but sometimes will sort of react directly uh, to things and tend to kind of mansplain a lot about, you know, particular kind of uh, genres and subgenres and so forth. Uh, people like John of ARTV or Anthony Fantano or the punk rock MBA is particular ones that I've dis discovered, or even a Fred uh, who used to be a member of Taking Back Sunday, who also reacts to emo videos, including for his own band. So that's expertise. Um, okay, so we're going to start with sadness. So one of the affects uh, most of work for subscribers is nostalgia, not only for particular songs, but also periods of their lives, which also implies feelings of sadness and loss. It's therefore unsurprising one of the key affects performed in reaction videos involves various degrees of sadness. This can be shown in anything from crying emojis and thumbnails, as you can see, um, and titles like Pink Floyd, Wish You Were Here Reaction, They Made Me Cry Again, or I Cried Like a Baby, Blink-182, Adam's Song Reaction. Uh, in the former Pink Metalhead dedicates the song to a patient of hers who recently passed away, welling up in the process of talking about him and providing meta-reflections on empathic listening, while the somewhat light treatment of suicide in Blink-182's Adam's song results in an even more personal performance of emotion on the part of India Reacts, who relates the song to her own experiences of feeling suicidal. And if you watch that video from about the five minute mark, you'll get very much what I'm uh, talking about. Similar reactions can be found to songs as different generically as R.E.M.'s Everybody Hurts or Tracy Chapman's Fast Car, regardless, or Black by Pearl Jam, for example. Regardless of the type of music, this form of reaction ratchets up the authenticity level by both effective performance of a body overwhelmed by emotion while listening and the divulging of highly personal experiences, which in turn enable viewers who perhaps felt these intense emotions when they first heard the tracks in question, but after decades, uh, these emotions have in inevitably faded away to fully feel them once again. Several reactors describe themselves as empaths and vehemently deny that anything about their live emotional reactions to music is fake. Reactors, therefore, through their own performance of effective embodied listening, give back to viewers their own past affectivity through these prosthetic acts of listening and feeling. Here, the racialized aspects of these effective ecologies uh, as mo emotive reactions of largely younger people of color for largely older, largely white users could be raised, but it would be a mistake to overgeneralize this and see it simply as a paid or unpaid servicing of nostalgia. Clearly, reactors get more out of these experiences than simply economic compensation or the sense of giving subscribers what they want. They instead have a cathartic experience, which many of them refer to in terms of love, family, or community, uh, that they feel both for their subscribers and from them. Um, Humor is another key affect, which is often performed by reactors, um, and several reactors also actually respond to things like comedy, you know, from television uh, and so forth, or stand-up. 
uh, sometimes on a separate channel, but it's not necessary to go to explicitly defined comedy when there are offspring videos that receive a disproportionate number of reactions considering their musical significance. So this applies to several of their videos, but especially there's a lot of reaction videos to Pretty Fly for a White Guy, uh, whose humorous roasting of a white wannabe could be seen as problematic for multiple reasons. Instead, reactors fully appreciate its humor and tend, if anything, to feel sorry for the protagonist's uh, failed attempts to appropriate black culture. Rather than being about critique, which does appear in some reaction videos, but more often hip hop ones like Joyner Lucas's I'm Not Racist, this video was responded to as pure comedy. In general, pop punk is a pro Pop punk as a genre is fairly suitable for this kind of response. For example, other Blink-182 videos or my personal favorite, The All-American Rejects Gives You Hell, that Billy You So Crazy reacts to, although he clearly sees through its surface humor, describing in the video subtitle as the most bitter song I ever heard, LMAO. Okay, and the third one, there's a lot more of these I could go through, but I'm just gonna just keep it to three. Uh, the third one, it seems to have got stuck. The third one is um, is shock and surprise, uh, which is a uh, which is uh, you know this can result from having certain expectations about what a piece of music will be like, either from the name of the artist or the or the track uh, or who recommended it, uh, and then it turns out to be quite different to that. But more dynamically, it's when a song changes dramatically at a given moment. And no songs perhaps more dramatic in this regard than the Ukrainian metalcore band Ginger and their song Pisces. Beginning as a mellow jazzy tune with an emotional and strong but sweet feminine vocals on the part of vocalist Tatiana Shmaliuk, at a given moment a rising squall of feedback gives way to heavy metal riffage and an extraordinary vocal performance of growling that has caused more than one reactor to virtually fall out of their seat, as can be seen in uh, examples like when, from Brad and Lex as well as from uh, Pink Metalhead uh, as well. And you can get a bit of an idea of that from their facial expressions, or you can watch the videos later. Um, something similar, if less dramatic, happens when JV of JVTV reacts to Weezer's Say It Ain't So, which he had turned up because it was so quiet, only to be floored by the sudden explosion of power pop noise after the first verses. Alternatively, Kay and Libby's reaction to My Chemical Romance's Welcome to the Black Parade is one of being energized synesthetically by all the elements from the vocals to the mise en scene of the video to the dramatic switch up of the music into a more punk style in the bridge, leading to multiple interruptions of the video and listening accompanied by energetic movement and even singing along to the chorus. These reactions are more generally these reactors, while very different, share a tendency to react less in terms of emotion than energy, whether or not this is accompanied or triggered by shock or surprise. However, this is um, no less effective labor than crying or laughing, and similarly translate music associated with specific largely white uh, subcultures, in this case, uh, emo, to a differently racialized act of listening informed by a previous history of reaction. So, for example, they compare uh, Welcome to the Black Parade, Kane Levy compare it to uh, the video that they'd seen of the Sex Pistols, which, you know, people within those subcultures probably would not make that link. Um, okay, so I just want to finish on some areas to be sort of further explored. Uh, so the first of these is around techniques of reactivity. So this includes everything from, you know, the verbal introductions, which often involve various kind of catchphrases uh, and so forth, to the decor and setting of a reaction, to the use of graphics by some reactors, to incorporation of secondary material like Wikipedia or Genius lyrics information about the music. Sincerely, KSO, for example, pays a lot of attention to color, both in terms of the decor and her outfits, accessories and makeup, which are all part of the reaction. Even the two paintings on the wall of a yellow flower and a bee are there specifically to refer to her subscribers, who she refers to as my honeys. And the, the, picture, the paintings are put up for the reaction. Kay and Livy, who are much younger, have a kind of call and response catchphrase, uh, the grind don't stop till it hits the top, to the what, to the top, to the tippity tippity top, accompanied by a graphic explosion to hype up their viewers, while others like JVTV and The J Show have some quite professional audiovisual opening sequences with music, graphics, and in the latter case, highlighting of material also available as merch, such as what she calls her handy dandy headphones. While India Reacts will supplement her intuitive homegirl interpretations of the meanings of songs uh, through Wikipedia, Sincerely KSO does performative readings of the lyrics of almost every song she reacts to, using them as a springboard for interpretation. 
Okay, another key point is about cross-cultural border crossings. Um, so I gave some indication of this as well about how this these reactions cross racialized generic boundaries of music listening. Uh, this is somewhat generalized as African Americans with hip hop and R&B backgrounds listening to white music genres. In fact, even in my examples, there's much more diversity. KSO is a Nigerian living in Canada with no hip hop background, but you know, gets background more in like African music. Pink Metalhead was a new metal fan from when she was a teenager, so her reactions only built on this background. And other reactors give truly global perspectives to reaction videos like uh, Enoma, who, which is short, which is an acronym for easygoing native outsiders making assessments. An Indian couple who often preface their reactions with an extreme emphasis on unedited authenticity, um, as well as listing their multiple uh, psychology degrees. Uh, or Africa React, who describes herself who's uh, from Kenya and describes herself as an African girl responding to music, comedy, and stories from around the globe. But boundaries can also be much closer to home. For example, in Brad and Lex's reaction to Low Key's Ghosts of Grenfell, which while still ostensibly within a familiar genre, involves a local uh, historical tragic fire taking place within the borough of Kensington and Chelsea in London. And they respond to quite a lot of hip hop, but they especially respond to a lot of UK hip hop. So you've got this kind of cross-cultural thing going on even between, even like within a particular genre. Um, so this video and its sequel actually becomes an impetus for learning about this tragedy and what it represents in terms of multiple forms uh, of inequality. And the final point, which is really the main one of this paper, is about effective ecologies and economies. So there's a lot more to reaction videos than meets the eye, um, from complex reactions, uh, relations between reactors and subscribers that are both effective and economic, to performance of authenticity as a value-adding brand, to battles that reactors engage with with the algorithmic governance of a YouTube platform. And just in the last day or so, uh, Jay, for example, got a, a copyright strike against her, which, you know, if you get three of those, you can have your whole channel completely taken down by YouTube and uh, there would be basically none of the content would exist anymore. Um, so, um, so yeah, so this view, the view of, of reaction videos presented by Rolling Stone article, for example, is quite misleading in this regard. A few, yes, a few of the most popular reactors might catch the attention of some music, fashion or other companies and be offered some kind of more legitimate career path, but this is a tiny minority. Even reactors who are very productive and might produce three videos a day and have approaching 100,000 subscribers get little or no corporate support or income from the platform and are just as likely to see the results of their work subject to takedown, silencing or other punitive actions on behalf of purported copyright holders uh, for what is on one level the sharing of advertising. For example, the famous Twins the New Trend, Phil Collins, something in the air tonight reaction led to a thousand percent spike in sales of a track so in a sense they're performing a service for popular music industries and yet they're subject to these kind of you know algorithmically uh detected sort of uh copyright strikes and so forth uh reactors therefore develop a whole range of strategies to avoid detection and blocking by the algorithm from using smaller windows to windows with distracting framings or multiple windows within windows um and so forth so um have i got time to conclude one minute yes please <laughs> um so at the very least reaction videos complex phenomenon of digital remediation of music and listening that as the rolling stone article does get right are changing the online landscape of popular music by crossings and even complete indifference to genre as well as contesting ideas that specific musical genres belong to racially delineated listeners whether that be of classic rock metal punk indie emo uh, or even hip-hop and r b while not explicitly political beyond this reaction video makers have frequently been politicized by the lack of support and outright interference from the platform in wholly siding with copyright holders against their creative practices in unjust and arbitrary ways uh, this has been expressed through videos directly addressing viewers uh, which are also there's a couple of those in the playlist uh, but also addressed to youtube as well both calling out the unfairness of its practices and underlining the value of these channels for the appreciation and circulation of a wide variety of popular music underlying this are utopian aspirations for alternative forms of sociality made possible by digital platforms in which there's not only a post-racial uh in quotation marks sharing and circulation of music and effects the formation of a sense of community or family embodied in many of the reactors discourses 
the role and significance of reaction videos is only likely to increase in the future in tandem with new modes and platforms of digital remediation. So that's some of the, the references and any questions for the end? Thank you so much, Michael. It was a wonderful paper. I really liked it. And I, I have at least four questions. But as I said, at the end of the panel, if someone has like a very small question or like a doubt or something I didn't understand, please uh, say something now. If not, we're going to go right uh, next to our second um, panelist, okay? And so while João sets this up, thank you again, Michael. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, João, and then if someone has anything to say, please um, put it in the chat. So uh, João Ricardo holds a master's degree in musical art. Um, he studies composition and soldado and participated in master classes, workshops with several composers and scholars. He holds a research grant at uh, Evora University and is working in a project PASEV, Patrimonialization of Evora's Soundscapes, and is also affiliated with CESEM uh, of the North University of Lisbon, investigating opera and contemporary music. And he's going to talk to us um, uh, uh, today about image music text creative criticism and the audiovisual essay towards music. And it's a pre-recorded uh, presentation. Um, and so afterwards, um, and again, I would just want to remind everyone that if you have something to say, even if it's not directly related uh, to the paper, but any comments, please, you can use the chat to keep this um, alive uh, and to then share some ideas. And then we go, um, then we gather everything up to the final discussion. Um, and yeah, so João, whenever you want to just start your video, and if Thank someone you. has any difficulties listening or anything, please let us know. Let me know if the video isn't running properly and I restart or something. So it is. Hope you like it. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for having me here. My name is João Ricardo, and I'm a composer and researcher at Universidade de Évora and Universidade Nova de Lisboa. I'll share with you today my recent endeavors on the audiovisual essay and its critical and artistic possibilities regarding music and more specifically opera. It has been stated even more so during these pandemic times how digital technology has a great potential to reinvigorate film and television criticism. And the audiovisual essay is, if anything, a favorite contender of said potential. Hybrid in nature, Lopez and Martin summarize it as a creative digital remix of found footage collage at one end and the film media essay at the other. Yet, according to Arlen Levick, the audiovisual essay isn't simply a way to share new research in a more accessible format, as it may also broaden or at least reframe intellectual inquiry. It exists as a tool for film studies, meant to merge insights and criticism within and through a video. The craft of the audiovisual essayist rests primarily in the editing and combination of various media outputs. As Christine Alvarez Lopez argues, the practices and techniques applied for the creation of a video essay derive from cinema itself. But before diving into analysis, I would first like writing to about different video essay possibilities, Nick Lokis recounts a video created by Thomas Vandenberg, reflecting on a scholastic and pragmatic approach, describing it as a worthy attempt at transferring text-based academic qualities to an audiovisual container, merging traditional textual explanations, reflections, and our commentaries. Although this seems to be the most common and accepted format, a combination of controlled visuals, audios, and texts, some creators and researchers rather venture towards a more poetic end of the spectrum, within the continuum between creative, poetic and explanatory pedagogical, a symbiosis evoked in what Adrian Martin connotates as creative criticism. A great example of this experimentation between art and scholarship, between intuitive, less reflexive processes of artistic creation and restrictive academic methods and protocols is Christine Alvarez Lopez on small gestures. The author explains how the sound ended up providing the global structure for this work as she organized the visual aspect of the essay. 
This reflection led to my own personal experiments on the audiovisual essay format and its relations and possibilities regarding sound and the musical universe. As a music composer, YouTube has been steadily fighting for a pole position at my internet browser history. The array of videos available are no longer considered simple products for simple consumption. The YouTube effect has changed art and the way people consume, create and share music. It is stocked with videos that both define and defy the aforementioned notions and structures regarding the audiovisual essay format. Although the majority of these videos work more as video lectures presenting voiceover to film stills or PowerPoint slides on autoplay, there are increasingly more audiovisual pieces striving for the more poetic and creative end of the spectrum. One example is a video called Flipping a Bit from Lachenmann's avant-garde music by the composer and content creator David Bruce. After a preliminary dive into Helmut Lachenmann's piece Pression and demonstrating compositional and technological processes used in the creation of found sound beats, David Bruce creates a hybrid piece from audiovisual fragments and created a work faithfully categorized as an audiovisual collage. Described as the unethical anthropologist, be it a visual, sound or word mix, the collage artist works through an assemblage of fragments and varying points of view, put together often in a non-linear way. The collage creator craft is very close to that of the audiovisual essayist situated in the space between mashup, experimental film and digital film criticism. And one example of such relation is Catherine Grant's Touching the Film Object. In this video essay, available on Vimeo, another famous audiovisual archive, one of the comments reads, you've aroused my interest sufficiently to dig deeper into the referenced literature. By quoting different images, music and text, Catherine Grant's video has revealed itself as something easily comparable to a beautiful collage, out of many objects and inspirations, dwelling and developing new interconnections and daringly exposing your theories with and within a creative object. Likewise, the next original audiovisual works aim to subvert the most common and usual formats expected in any video regarding music, more specifically opera. Bernard Kahn advocates for an opera and film connection, as they have influenced each other since the beginning of cinema, and relations between the two media can be observed up to the present day, and this almost primal relation further sustained my convictions in the possibilities of the audiovisual essay, regarding a potential and artistic connection with operatic objects. It wasn't my intention to create videos whose meanings can be summarized in writing. What I aim to achieve with the creation of this triptych is to strip the core components and recombine them with different intertextual objects in a network of intertextual references that challenge the unity and self-presence of the viewing subject, while maintaining the thematic core of each opera. In practice, the goal is to explore the combination of fragments in relation to each specific opera, while at the same time trying to underline its unique characteristics by merging them into new audiovisual pieces, treating opera as a point of departure for a deeply reflective poetic and creative transformation. The opera used as the core of the first audiovisual essay is Salome by Richard Strauss, based on the homonymous work by Oscar Wilde. The story can be outlined by the defiance and rejection of Johannan towards Salome, but also by the same defiance and rejection of the princess of Judea, daughter of Herodias, towards her stepfather, the King Herod. The visual operatic root of the video essay, The Dance of the Seven Veils, is performed by Maria Hewing on her famous role as Salome in Los Angeles Opera 1986 production of Strauss's opera. Regarding the sounds themselves, the newly diegetic metronome is a combination and manipulation of factory sounds, 
intended to keep her dance regular, but slowly they synchronize the tempo, as the desire for the head of the Baptist interferes. Also, different voices of different Salomés, the never-ending repetition of her wishful cravings for the head of the Baptist, were arranged from various performances of Wilde's play found on YouTube. The solo voice along the dance is meant to represent not only Salome's lonely desires, rough and hurty, as well as religious, evoking valors of evil and death as empathically as the longing for redemption, but also her purity, her independence. The soprano was taken from the fourth movement of the Sands of Peter Borgnamisha, for soprano and piano by the composer Georgi Kurtal. The text section of this video essay, closed captioned, was taken from the book Arrebour, by the French writer Juris Carl Wiesner. In chapter 5 of the novel, the main character offers a poetical obsessed description of a painting of Salome, both Beauty and Beast, as she became the symbolic deity of indestructible lust, the goddess of immortal hysteria. The correspondences between Wiesner's decadent novel and Oscar Wilde extend beyond the play, as the first also relates to Wilde's book The Picture of Dorian Gray not only in its thematic juxtapositions as well as an almost direct reference of Wiesmann's work, as it supposedly is the unnamed yellow book which Dorian reads and which profoundly affects him. The second opera of this triptych is Don Giovanni, composed by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. In this video, instead of focusing on the main operatic character, a fictional Spanish seducer based on the stories of Don Juan dating back to the 17th century, the light is shined upon Donna Elvira, a soprano playing a lady from Burgos, abandoned by Don Giovanni. The music is the aria sung by Elvira in Act 2, Scene 2, Mi Tradi Que Alma Ingrata performed by Cecilia Bartoli in 2001 at Zurich, Switzerland. Elvira reflects and shares her feelings of betrayal and pity towards Don Giovanni, while still caring for him. The Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard provides a very striking recollection of Elvira in his 1843 book Iteror. Seduced and abandoned by Don Giovanni, Elvira, in this unique and fleeting moment, becomes the focus of our attention. Kierkegaard's insight regarding Elvira also provides a beautiful connection with the image quotations of this video. A lonely girl dancing and conducting in a solitary room for an empty crowd, reminiscent of her newly found and quickly lost passion. And just like Elvira, at this instant she is visible and can be seen. Pure is a 2010 movie by Lisa Langset. The main character, portrayed by Alicia Vikander, is a young soul who in the midst of her troubled life, enjoys a recurring solace with the music of Mozart. The 20-year-old Katrina finds herself seduced by the Gothenburg Symphony conductor after bluffing her way into a receptionist job in said symphony offices, only to be left alone and in love following a temporary fling. Just like Elvira, she has been wronged by an experienced seductor. Just like Elvira, she is young and yet her life's supply is exhausted. Just like Elvira, she cannot stop loving him, and yet he deceived her. Regarding the textual component of the audiovisual essay, instead of choosing another description of Elvira that would suit Catherine perfectly, the same book either or offers this beautiful paragraph, as I tried to chase the poetic awakening of both characters. The text itself is being written on the screen, as if being typed, just like
catalyzer to use this opera on the third audiovisual piece came after a fairly recent rewatch of the movie Philadelphia, directed by Jonathan Demme, when the lawyer portrayed by Tom Hanks introduces, narrates and translates throughout the recording of Maria Callas the famous aria La Mama Morta from Umberto Giordano's 1896 opera Andrea Chenier. The character Madalena, a young and beautiful aristocrat ruined by the revolution, sings to a public prosecutor about her murdered mother, an aria contrasted between the first part, a tale of death and misery, and the second part, a hymn to love. As the text was intended to stand as the main focus and thematic reasoning of the video essay, the research and inspiration of the use of text in various audiovisual essays reveals itself worth mentioning. My first influence came from double-screen audiovisual essays like Hitchcock and De Palma split-screen bloodbath or David Lynch's Blue Velvet and the Elephant Man, to name only a few, maintaining the filmic references for this piece while also turning away from the recurring vertical split-screen practice. New models were found on different works, the so-called script-to-screen, fairly common for the social media lover in videos that combine scenes and scrolling text dialogue of famous films. Considering the excessively close relation with the cinematic universe, the images used in this piece were not chosen from a movie. Instead, the attentions were focused on Attack on Titan, following the Arias theme of a murdered paternal figure. The 2013 Japanese manga series created by Hajime Isayama follows a protagonist out to revenge his deceased mother in a civilization full of many teen titans. As the series reaches its climatic ending in the current year of 2021, the concept of loop becomes one of the main plot characteristics. The eternal recurrence concept also influenced the images used in this piece, as the landscapes were rearranged to create the notion of a daily cycle. The music itself is also meant to follow this Nietzschean postulation through a constant repetition of the introduction of Jeff Buckley's cover of Bob Dylan's Mama You've Been On My Mind. Not only is the title and themes of the song fitting to the maternal tragic love concerning both the image and the text of this audiovisual essay, but the F major chord progression creates a great antithesis with the themes of sadness and loss being portrayed. The three audiovisual essays were all created and edited in iMovie, as it is the video editing software I'm most familiar with. Regarding the audio and sound alone, I once again turn to one of the simplest and most common software available, Audacity. I believe that the three pieces above fall under the category of what Manu Yanez connotates as intuitive essayists' essays, audiovisual creators and or audiovisual content unafraid of hermeticism, who prefer suggestion to evidence or intuition to certainty. The final videos are the apex of the aforementioned literature, trending lightly across lavics and kisses for all purposes, but mainly focusing and deepening into the poetical research and creative criticism works of creators like Lopez and Grant. My goal was not only to analyze and expose the practices of said researchers and creators, the new formats and concepts, but also to transpose their theoretical and practical outcomes to the operatic universe. Thank you so much for your attention and see you in a second. Thank you so much, Ricardo. It was really cool. And the fact that it's already a video essay about audiovisual yes. essays, it's like, it's very interesting. So I hope that uh, that also um, makes up some ideas for people in the, the final discussion. So again, if anyone has any quick question on any doubt please say them now if not i'll i'll start um introducing our final author for this panel um so so yeah so uh, Annika Kampman is an artist and researcher currently undertaking a practice-led PhD at the Slate School of Art under the supervision of John Thompson, David Burrow, and Benedict Drew. Her artworks include videos, performances, records, websites, essays, and lectures, analyzing how the culture industry reproduces personality for profit, addressing issues of standardization, reprodu reproduction, 
and artistic autonomy within the global circulation of pop music. Operating through a range of theoretical, fictional, and artistic frames, her works draw from her own experiences as a musician alongside the methods and arguments of institutional critique, restaging the techniques of the cultural industries in an imminent critique of pop. She has presented performances and exhibitions at in locations including Tramway, Glasgow, Pump House Gallery, London, uh, Jerwood Space, London and Chapter Arts Centre in Cardiff. And she's going to present us UR Distributed Media Music Video as Imminent Critique, whenever you want, uh, Anneke, please start and thank you. Thank you so much for um, that introduction, that's great. Um, sorry, you had to read such a lengthy text. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for having me. It's really nice to get to speak to you all um, from London. Um, and yeah, the conference seems really, really interesting. And I'm looking forward to watching some performances later on. Um, might be quite late for me, but that, that's, that's exciting. Um, okay, I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, are you seeing this? Yes. Yes, everything is perfect. Yeah. Cool. That's good. Um, all right, here we go. Um, music is on the move. It appears to us through Wi-Fi enabled screens. In short, repeated fragments. Just, a, just long enough to arrest our attention. It circulates via compressed visual forms. Alexa, play the new Taylor Swift on Amazon Music. As YouTube clips and Instagram ads, designed to, amongst other things, stimulate consumption. Yet never before have the specific sonorities of the musical object itself been harder to hear, no longer confined to the boundaries of a physical product or its associated hardware. Songs, at least within the Wi-Fi secured networks of the global north, come to us in streams, transmitted via subscriptions to digital intermediaries such as Spotify, Apple Music and YouTube. The stream is both abundant and selective. As sales of di discrete musical objects, the cassette tapes, CDs and records of older industrial models fluctuate towards decline, we have seen an important transformation in the way musical products generate or often fail to generate value online. Where once the record sleeve justified its existence as a container for sound, a secondary artistic medium to the prim primary musical recording, Music itself is increasingly viewed as the vehicle through which an evolving repertoire of extra musical products, including but not limited to films, television appearances, clothing, consumer electronics, digital technology and more, are promoted, dispersed and monetized. So I'm going to kind of draw from my own work as a practicing artist um, and also briefly from the, the methods and arguments of critical theory including the quite divergent traditions of the Frankfurt School and also British Cultural Studies. Um, my talk's going to centre on the form and the function of contemporary music video in this kind of scenario that I've just described. So focusing specifically on the music video's internal dynamics, its hybridity and audiovisuality, the talk will make a series of propositions as to how these elements in particular have been mobilized by visual artists and musicians to imminently critique music video and in doing so a broader set of social socio-economic shifts. One, artwork, advert, commodity. Popularized by MTV and distributed globally 24 hours a day from 1981, music video has, since its inception, constituted a site of conflicting artistic and promotional commitments. The product, according to Simon Frith, of a music industry defined by crisis, 1978 to 1982, promos and MTV allowed struggling record labels to not only broaden the audiences for their products through national airplay, but generate new income streams through retransmission, product placement, and the label's own vertical integration 
for industries. Music video then became useful for its ability to unite pops, historically distributed elements, the song, a performance, its recording, merchandise, and even the branded figure of the artist themselves into one convenient package. A hybrid form that blurs distinctions, not only between a product and its advertisement, but between promotional and artistic form. This um, interdependence can be expressed in the, in the form of this diagram, um, or also in another way. Pop music video then came to represent a space of negotiation between these elements, these three key elements, alongside their respective institutions, popular music, feature film and television, and fine art, a medium whose very artistic possibilities are grounded within the activities of art's opposite, never able to fully prevent possible recuperation by corporate interests, nor never entirely really subsumed. An example of what Stuart Hall has described as an important attribute of black popular culture, a tradition to which music videos, most vital contributions arguably belong, a site of strategic contestation in which there are no pure forms at all, but rather a diasporic mixing of elements. As music video budgets expanded throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, so too did the artistic possibilities and cultural significance of the form. Music videos came to be understood not only as promotional tools, but as independent works of experimental moving image exhibited as such in their own right. What had started out, perhaps, you know, this is debatable, in the late 1970s, as a field of ad hoc independent productions had, by 19, 1993, become an internationally profitable industry. Despite its, high, its new high profile, music video retained its ethos of experimentation, coming to function as a testing ground, not only for the development of new techniques and technologies, such as the kind of infinite, infamous matrix bullet time effect created by Michel Gondry, but as spaces where aspiring feature film directors could make their debuts. A site where audiovisual realism, its conventions and traditions could be revised, re-engineered or simply rejected. A medium whose artistic possibilities, however, were always to be considered like a dialogue um, between a producer and the one or more commercial interests funding a music video's production. In the early 2000s, digitization and the rise of an internet enabled form of musical distribution, where music is compressed and circulated globally, often for free, represents an ontological crisis for recorded music. As major labels turn away from traditional forms of accumulation, opting instead to focus on the cultivation and administration of the intellectual property rights of a few major artists managed um, through the form of like 360 degree contracts. The role played by visual forms of marketing, such as music video, became increasingly important. However, whilst you might imagine that this scenario would, would kind of mark a widespread return to an investment in the music video, Paradoxically, the inverse kind of seems to be true. Following the financial crisis of 2008, the music video sector has become one of increased polarization. As major record labels concentrate their efforts on the production of a small number of feature, fail, feature film scale music video projects per cycle, the rest of the field is left to be populated by independent, amateur, or even fan-produced works. Now required to compete on a global marketplace of endless audiovisual products, the creative possibilities of music video are constrained to ever-narrowing timeframes. Whilst this scenario um, might seem bleak, it does also contain certain opportunities. 
For artists like Hype Williams, whose work in my interpretation represents an imminent critique of capitalism and its dominant forms of commodification, the constantly shifting terrain of music video pro provides an apparently never ending field of new forms and sites through which artists and musicians might conduct a critique. And here by imminent critique, I mean, um, those artworks which sort of um, attempt to conduct a critique through the internal operations of a chosen object, as opposed to like a critique conducted from a, a position outside. Um, so in the case of music video, um, an imminent critique would be um, a critique that approaches music video through its very own like audio visuality, through its own languages, terms and concepts. So I'd now like to, to sort of turn to the more propositional part of my paper, and I'm going to discuss the work of two artists and a musician whose practices all kind of engage these conditions, but differently. Um, so deferring the image. For the last few decades, American artist Tony Cox has, according to Christoph Cox, been engaged in a sustained and critical deconstruction of the short visual formats em emblematic of consumer capitalism, the advertisement, the music video, and the trailer. Cox's works occupy the visual languages of these forms, focusing on three main elements, image, text, and sound. Often consisting of at least one piece of ready-made music, an appropriated critical or theoretical text, rendered as uniform type on screen. You can see that in this kind of still of a recent exhibition by Cox, um, and a single colored background or simple texture. These basic components are reconfigured in the form of an apparently never ending audio visual scroll or swipe. Broken up by rapid cuts in time with the music, Cox's remixes upend dominant hierarchies between forms. As Cox again writes, the primacy of the image, the, suple the supplementing caption or critical text, the supporting soundtrack. Reminiscent of music videos, distinctive audiovisual construction where sound determines image, the work's rhythmic structures facilitate unexpected conjunctions between text and sound, fostering new associations and affects across and between this material. At the heart of this lies an attempt to foreground the speculative potential of sound, an approach Cox describes as deferring or denying the image in favor of the rhythms and sonorities of a chosen musical object. Where, as Paul Gilroy has written, the image attests to a delimited and self-complete world. Aud sound and audio recording disrupt the sense of completeness, certainty, and evidence, often accorded to the visual. Able to transcend the given, music and sound, writes Gilroy, possess an openness not often accorded to the visual image. So presented as part of a recent series of exhibitions, untitled MJ the Symptom, which is the work you're just having a look at on screen, combines fragments derived from a text written by music critic Mark Fisher uh, in 2009, I think, with a soundtrack of appropriated music. Tracks include J. Doe by jo Joy Orbison, Scream by Michael and Janet Jackson, and various other works that sam sample Jackson directly. The piece critiques the manner in which the star's performing body has and continues to be commodified. Forced to, in the words of Cox again, lend its special exotic allure to the marketing of an extraordinary range of commodities and services. Just as 
Billie Jean was in instrumentalized by the Pepsi Corporation in the production of a 1983 advert for the drink, the artist's body reduced to a set of signs or signifiers. So too is Jackson's voice and body registered as fragments, ghostly presences upon Coke's soundtrack. Coke's works then, like the constantly updating Instagram feeds of the cultural forms they wish to critique, place considerable demands upon the attention of their audience. Having to contend with various, sometimes conflicting streams of material simultaneously, a little bit like this talk with the um, auto-generated text that you're seeing on screen, we are, as audio viewers, made aware of just how much is missed in a single viewing. By appealing to the repeat, to repeat and sustained modes of engagement, the work offer respite from the distracted reception and immediate forms of consumption encouraged under late capitalism, appealing instead to our capacities to listen. Through this act of listening, we might come to experience effective registers not prescribed within the already existing and appropriated text and sound, operating on and against dominant norms, the works act to destabilize the mythologies of a late capitalist culture bound to indefinite expansion. Three, over-identification. Whilst Cox's critique operates through an over-identification with music video form, its rapid cuts, anti-realist tendencies and spectacularized images, the moving image productions of British pop musician Charlie XCX and her team operate through an over-identification with pop's main subject, the digitally mediated pop star as living advert. And I use the term living advert to describe these kind of avatar-like personalities that are presented to us as commodities by the culture industry. Like my previous description of Jackson, these formations consist of a constellation of affects and signifiers, a kind of ad plus version of the performer as brand, a subject delineated as individual, despite being industrially, and so in some sense, collectively authored and produced, produced and reproduced. Um, music video plays an important role in presenting this living advert and its products to us. A form. Unlock it blends seamlessly into an Instagram timeline, where a 10 second loop of the visualizer cycles, ready to be skipped or replayed, destined to be consumed on a mobile phone, XCX's work acknowledges, perhaps even exaggerates, its status as a commodity. Through her use of avant-garde musical techniques, so atypical song forms, the splitting of a single voice into heavily treated, almost plaintive vocal layers, she injects a dissident, acerbic quality into the never-ending stream of self-similar musical products that populate the algorithmically controlled and constantly updating playlists of YouTube and Spotify. It is this capacity to render sonically the broader conditions underpinning its production that for me make the work eminently critical. Unlike Tony Coates's practice, which actively works against dominant myths of capital accumulation in an attempt to activate effective experiences not reducible to the conditions of the present. XEX animates music videos contemporary structures of feeling, making it clear that for her, the horizon of her imminent critique can only ever be the present. Four, immersion. The final artist whose work I would like to discuss um, and just kind of put on the table is um, that of US-based visual artist, Martine Sims. Where Tony Coates's critique operates through music videos most basic components, Charlie XCX over identifies with Pop's key subjectivities, for in fact she is one, exposing and ultimately capitalizing upon music videos dominant modes of production in the present, Martin Sims's work seems to be positioned kind of somewhere between the two. Describing herself as a conceptual entrepreneur, 
Sims's practice, according to the artist, emulates different popular forms like commercials, memes, and television sitcoms, often occupying the form of reproducible commodities such as cassettes, t-shirts, and books. The work turns the commercial models of production and dissemination one has come to expect from the cultural industries, so popular music, fashion, but also um, graphic design, into a contemporary artistic practice. Whilst represented in the UK by a commercial gallery, Sadie Coles, Sims's artworks seek to destabilize the boundaries or perhaps hierarchies um, that exist between cultural production and um, pop cultural production and the world of contemporary post-conceptual art. Recent works such as Ugly Plymouths, um, a three-channel video installation from 2020, 2020 um, blend images of beach scenes, domestic scenes, and music concerts with scenes of the everyday life of the artist. Rather than operating as a work to be viewed from a distance, the piece renders music video, music video spatially. So it kind of creates it, remakes it as an environment um, within which the viewer is like actively immersed. What ensues in, in the installation is a sung and spoken dialogue between three characters, Hot Dog, Hot Dog Doobie and La Kisaba, an audio visual chorus between living adverts played out through the language and temporality of a social media platform displaced into the gallery setting. This work, when considered in relation to that of both Tony Cox and Charlie XCX then, might be understood as something of a common denominator. The best of both worlds, popular music and contemporary art, or perhaps the worst of both. On the one hand, Sims's practice by adopting repetition um, as its primary strategy, inhabiting Pop's forms and syntactical devices, seeks to stay inside the time of Black popular culture, its conventions, histories, and traditions, appealing to the capacities of the popular, a form Stuart Hall and Paddy Winnell once described in 1964, I should say, um, as not an art created for everybody, but an art which has the pressure behind it to be widely available and understood. Able to draw upon and transform a given set of vernacular traditions. On the other hand, it could also be argued that Sims's practice neglects the criticality integral to any su successful imminent critique. The work, whilst consuming with the popular and its ghostly forms, loses sight of the important critiques of tradition integral to the best of popular art, the work of Hype Williams, for example, um, as well as avant-garde or autonomous forms of art. Furthermore, as Tony Coates's practice points out, the work of visual artists can and should aspire to do more than simply re-render that which exi exists and is enjoyed elsewhere. Um, that is the end of my paper. Let me just um, share this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annika. Really, really interesting. And um, and yeah, so we just reached the end of our panel. Uh, if everyone, whoever wants to uh, turn on your camera so that we can like gather in this um, final discussion. And I didn't want to uh, pose my questions first. I would like to see uh, who uh, wants to, um, yeah, of course, whoever wants to put the camera, yeah. Um, and um, so if anyone has uh, any questions I would like to do, either uh, speaking or by chat, if wants to speak, please raise your hand on Zoom. Um, because during the papers, there were some, um, Paula asked a question to Michael, now to Jean Ricardo. Um, so I don't know if you want to start with that. If not, I will just go by the order of the chat and then people, uh, go, um, and ask their questions. So, 
uh, yeah, and Michael, you already saw the question that Paula uh, asked you. So if you want to answer that first, if you want, uh, sure. uh, so and then it was a while ago. So. <laughs> it was a while ago, but I can ask again. Do you want me to read, or maybe I'll, I can read for everyone to yeah. to yeah. to listen? So. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for a very challenging exposition. I particularly appreciate the way you approached or analyzed the set of these YouTubers and the way they organize their apparently informal space in order to leech the listener and make him react. What is your experience with the viewers? Do you think that some of them are actually aware of the device that is behind the reactions? Yeah, I, I wasn't entirely sure what she meant by the device. I think it's the thing that you were talking about how all the the, the technicity of the videos, yeah, the staging, the, the, staging the lighting, the, the, yeah. and also the, the way setting. they talk. Yeah. I mean, I think it's integrated into the experience. So I think, I mean, I think the viewers are aware of that. And I think they're also kind of like, uh, I mean, obviously the, the viewers are only present through comments and the comments are, there's certain genres of comments, like the, Sometimes it's just about reliving the music. So it's like, oh yeah, that song that meant so much to me when I was 11 and you know, whatever, which has, doesn't have anything to do with reaction video, but often it's like, there's a lot of appreciation for reaction. And sometimes they, they really, you know, it, it, and what's interesting about it is that almost all of the comments are pretty positive. Whereas when you, if you go to some of these guys who are like these kind of expert reviewers, there'll be lots of, you know, kind of arguments and sort of trash talking and disagreements and so forth. Whereas, whereas, you know, I, I sort of think that um, there tends to be an appreciation of the generosity of the reactors sharing their kind of personal sort of reaction responses and, and, and sometimes very personal feelings or even life events. And, you know, generally I, I found few kind of negative responses. It's usually very kind of uh, kind kind of affirmative, even to a point where, you know, one reactor like Jay, for example, went out and had coffee with one of her subscribers who was like, you know, uh, a woman happened to be in the same area at that time. And so they, they went to the mall or something, you know, so it's kind of like, there's something very kind of um, affirmative about it, I guess. Uh, there was another question uh, uh, to Michael too by uh, Teish. Uh, could we see a relationship between reaction videos channels on YouTube and the space of the record store, more or less as it appears in the book movie High F uh, Fidelity? It used to be a place where you could go to listen or watch music videos and talk to the people there. Is the record store as a space for sociability also being remediated, perhaps? Yeah, and then I would say that applies really well to the kinds of videos I wasn't talking about. Like if you took it, if you look at ARTV or Fantano or whatever, that's just like the guy you would meet at the record store who knows everything about every kind of genre. And also they kind of almost substitute for what the music press used to do. So music press is virtually nothing now, but you know, all these sort of functions of this kind of informed kind of interesting critical responses in a sort of vernacular way are done by these kind of amateur critics. And some of them are really interesting. Like John started doing this stuff when he was 16 and he's been doing it consistently for 10 years or something but the reactors that i'm talking about you know you wouldn't meet them in the record store or you know the, the encounters that are taking place wouldn't have happened uh in real life you know prob probably because they're you know they're people coming from really quite different uh kinds of backgrounds and creating this kind of sociality that wouldn't exi exist i don't think without 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 the network so in a sense i sort of think that that's actually something that that's new that doesn't correspond to something that kind of um you know, had a previous previous sort of analog kind of uh, version of it, which is partly what I find so interesting. And I think it's a very big difference too between people who whose kind of you know uh, assets, if you like, are their ability to listen and respond is very different than people who are coming in with some other pre existing skills. Like, for example, there's a lot of vocal coach reacts to or guitarist reacts to or music producer reacts to, which can cross different kinds of lines as well. But, you know, it is coming from some sort of pre existing sort of expertise, whereas the ones that I was focusing on, you know, their, their expertise is the is the listening, basically. Okay. 
Uh, so, and um, there was a question to Ricard, but he already answered in the chat. And now Enrique has his hand raised. I don't know if you want to put a question. Uh, I don't know to who, yeah. but uh, sure. Yes, sir. I want. Can I? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. So, uh, uh, one, uh, one uh, two questions for Michael and one for Aneki. The first one is, uh, are, are there uh, reaction videos uh, about reaction videos? Uh, is there this kind of commenting on, on the community by the community or is, is it a kind of conceptual artist way of thinking? And uh, if, if there is some interesting, if, if, if Michael Finn thinks there is an interesting perhaps connection between these practices and uh, these early cinema industry practices of having someone looking at the, the audience, uh, the, the, the audience reactions in the early uh, movies to see if the, the movie is uh, working, uh, like in the pre-releases of the movies, if there is some something that maybe is interesting about this connection or, or if it's not. Uh, for Aneke, I I was I am interested uh, right now in in the in this tension between uh, the the character of uh, work of art and of propaganda this tension in uh, music videos, and so if she could uh, recommend some uh, readings on that, uh, uh, also if if this tension is. Uh, uh, it's it's not present in these uh, examples, more art examples that she gave. If that tension uh, is translated to another tension, like uh, the tension between uh, uh, the the art uh, content and the critic content, I don't know. That's it. Hopefully, I, I was not obscure. So yeah, so maybe uh, Michael and then uh, Anneke, and then I will put some questions in that order too. Okay, I'm not sure what I've got the whole of your both questions, but I'll, I'll see what I can do. I mean, I think, yeah, there is some meta, the various different kinds of meta things that go on. Like one one thing, I mean, like for example, um, you know, uh, one reactor, Jamal, AKA Jamal, he, he quite often likes just to make a video where he just calls out his favorite reactors and will name them. And then they'll, they'll mention that response on their video. And so, you know, there's, there's all this kind of stuff going on, not so much on a kind of judging ranking kind of thing, although more on the expert review kind of reactions, uh, you tend to get a bit more of that. Um, like the, they're really into these tier lists where people will put bands or genres or, you know, junk food or anything onto a list of what's you know what's of a high high like supreme level excellent blah 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 like you're at you know school or university or something and they'll do that with their favorite you know youtubers etc so there's there's a kind of very different meta things going on and the final example i'll give is like the one of i had one image from of this organized react channel where they have kids react to teens react to college students elders you know whatever um and quite of what they'll do is they'll have like let's say you know teenagers reacting to you know blink 182 videos that were all like before they were born and then they'll get in blink 182 to react to the teens reacting to them so you know there's, there's various different ways this kind of meta meta stuff can um can come in but in a sense you know maybe it takes away a little bit from the performance of this sort of, you know, kind of immediacy, etc. Was it was there another question? Um, or did that answer it? Uh, about the, uh, the possible uh, relation with the early cinema, the people watching people, the audience in the, the pre pre releases, etc. Yeah, well, well, not in, I mean, they're not kind of, they're not kind of testing a product. So it doesn't have that aspect to it um but it is like uh you know and again you know maybe it's uh a little bit more of a kind of uh you know like on the re more reviewy type channels it's more like a you know a new album or a song or whatever will come out and then several of these 
you know, reviewers will, you know, will listen to it, either performatively listen to it or just talk about it, etc. which could be a sort of a, you know, you could think of as a kind of a focus group or, or, um, or something like that. But with the actual, you know, sort of emotional responders, I sort of think that often that stuff, they're not, they're not often responding to things that are very new. Um, and and uh, it's quite random, it's slightly random how things get to be on the channels. But then again, you know, once something comes up on one, one channel, it will come up on every channel. So there's a very strange kind of circulation going on. There's a bit more archaeological and, and really removed from any kind of, uh, you know, sort of marketing strategy other than other than just developing, you know, developing the channel and, you know, increasing the subscribers and that kind of thing. Um, hey, Henrik. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not sure if I completely like picked up on 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 um, the like intricacy of of your question, but I think I sort of gen I have a sense a, a general sense of like what you were trying to um, respond to. So um, I think like I'm interested in music video as an artist because I think um, it's this like forum which which was kind of historically kind of um pushed out um of being considered like within the world of like fine art i mean there's maybe a few practices that like the work of Jer derek jarman for example um there's a few other people like in a uk context that whose work like they like they produced music videos for bands um and so like i think yeah, it's a form which its history is one of like kind of straddling these two worlds, like popular music and contemporary art. Um, but it it took like the art world a long time to kind of really respond to music video. I think. Um, though I would say that is like that that um scenario has changed. Um, music videos are like increasingly presented within the gallery. There's like an increasingly large number of like shows which are presenting music videos that are both produced by like people that call themselves visual artists but also people who might call them some, themselves something else um and I think you asked about like writers um I think yeah for me like I I'm interested there's like a really um rich tradition of like writing about music video in cultural studies so the work of people like um Simon Frith um, he has a book called Art Goes Pop, which I, I found for a very helpful read. Um, various various kind of other people from that tradition. Um, but I suppose for me, like I, I always wanted to try to bring in a kind of discussion of like art. I know that's like a huge term, but like to think about the music video as 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 art and to sort of draw upon like the theories and um, uh, like contemporary theories of like of of contemporary arts like commodification um and to use those theories as like a, a lens through which to consider the music video um I would recommend the work of like Kojo Eshin um, he's written a lot about my favorite music video artist um Hype Williams so yeah he's really good can I ask a question to uh, Nikki yes yeah, I just wondered if you wanted to comment on the, the 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 difference between, you know, artists who are kind of using some elements of a music video form, as you kind of presented with Coke and uh, so forth, and the say the Charlie XCX version, which you could also arguably also find in say the work of I don't know people as different as Chris Cunningham or Spike Jones or like say the you know things like Lemonade and the which is kind of collective project, I guess, or this is America and so forth, which, you know, clearly, I mean, I think I would say some of those works which are produced kind of as music videos, not as art, have mm -hmm. every bit as much, you know, artistic, as many sort of things to say, I guess, about not only about music video form, but also all the elements about, you know, whether it's sort of capitalism or racism or anti-racism or what, whatever, as, you know, what kind of artists are doing. I mean, do, do you feel like the need to kind of, distinguish those things or do you think that, that you know what, what do you where do you think the kind of this is a question like I've been thinking about a lot 
because also like one of the reasons why I was like so drawn to music video as a form um, to make work at about or like through as an artist but also like as a researcher um, it was like examples like this is America like these are like work to me they're like they exist in this kind of lineage um, that I think Hype Williams is potentially like a very important figure um, in which is like using the kind of um, mechanisms and um, spaces of like popular music as a like commercial industry as like a site from which to produce something that for me like has the qualities of like art <laughs> um, and it, it like the, the, the role those works play in the world it is like is as kind of critically engaged and um, critically reflexive as like any kind of you know work of art that you might see in a gallery um, so it's like a, an unresolved problem in my mind um, but when yeah like they challenge the sort of preconceptions that 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 we might have about like um the spaces wherein like a kind of critical or like autonomous like form of art is produced um and and in challenging that it, it also like I think we have to sort of develop like a more and more kind of nuanced like understanding of like through like reading these like specific works through like so like reading like this is America there's like complex things that are going on in that work that for me like are the are the reasons why it like stands up as an as an artwork um, and it, I suppose it's about like understanding those things and like trying to sort of prioritize them but also like like I kind of tried to outline in the paper like there's this like tension that I'm trying to hold which is like do we think um, like, um, yeah, this kind of like the work of like Hall, Stuart Hall, like this kind of Gramsci and like, is it, it, are we simply looking at like a kind of field of like cultural production and we like measure like the, the um, potentials of like works on their like individual merit or, or, or can we like, can we continue to kind of like, um, operate through a sort of like Adornian model wh where there is such a thing as like a kind of a distinction between um, uh, an, an autonomous and an instrumentalized form of art. <laughs> That's like a real um, massive question, but I'm trying to, I'm, I'm aware of those two poles and I'm like trying to think through them. Yeah, I mean, it's really fascinating. Uh, so we still have I am, and I, I think I, I'd like to uh, ask myself. Um, I ask myself. I can ask the questions I was um, considering to each one of you, and maybe since we're with Anik, I'll start with her, and then we'll go back to the, to the beginning of the panel. And um, and I was just like really thinking, and um, your paper really made me question about this idea of. Um, the triangle, the, the triptych that you um, propose, sometimes depending on the, the platform, we can see which one is, is more important than the other one. And I was just thinking, like you mentioned the Pepsi advert, and I mean, isn't Pepsi like the ultimate definition of this triptych that you're thinking in uh, social, the social media is in, in the last few years have been increasing the relevance of people making uh, such high expectations on what does, what, is the advert this year? What will we show in the Super Bowl? And uh, is it more artistic than in the last year? Which is the artist? Like, so this idea of um, Pepsi is beyond commodity and beyond the artwork or the advert. So it's Pepsi is the music video and how uh, that moment uh, annually creates this idea that you're talking about, which is um, really, yeah, Pepsi is like God in this, uh, during the, the the Super Bowl, and so it, can we think about the Super Bowl performance? And when we think performance, the video also that comes up with Pepsi, uh, this commodified expectation um, in this idea of artwork, and then how that is transposed mainly for Instagram and also for for TikTok now in these last few years. Um, and I was also thinking about this idea of the XTX 
as this multi-screen persona, if we can also see this, um, this multi-screen also in this multimedia, but media as being uh, inevitably social. And so this, if you can, if you can relate all this and let me just know what you're thinking. And, um, and I think I'll just do all the questions now and then each one of you will try to answer it. And maybe I think we can find some convergence points too. To Juan Ricardo, I was just thinking, um, your, your answer to Paula uh, was very enlightening too, because I was having some questions. But then I was just wondering, uh, mainly on Instagram is we can see that so many pages are like um, turning to this idea of the artistic, but with the very quick consumption of what we can see as very artsy and this idea of high art. So if I see a nice TV show, but then I can also look at some fragments of some opera that was also a present in a movie. And I put that with the example that you show with the script underneath, but then you have a very artsy way to present either in stories or in posts. Do you see that as a way that the page is validated not by the users, but by the content itself. And the content becomes an autonomous way to validate that page because of the way they present uh, these contents and they try to make that very artsy. Um, and that also relates to this idea of video essays and how people, mainly on YouTube, are putting in moving images things that at the beginning we would think they would be only seen uh, on papers writing because it's very information and so we put that in video essay and that channel immediately gains a reputation of this is high quality content uh, i can learn with this i can feel super intellectual and that can be applied to a lot of channels that sometimes aren't as sciencey and more artsy if i'm making myself clear and to michael uh, at, um, finally i was also thinking uh if you can see in these uh, reaction video channels and hierarchy, considering the genre and the device that you spoke about. So we see that uh, the better the channel has a better design and we see like, I'm an expert, mainly in the genre, uh, the metal genre and subgenres. I'm like super expert. I'm going to react to the technicity and all the accuracy of that band, the latest single. And then if I have my girlfriend, she doesn't know anything. So let me do that expert mansplaining. But then you have other genres like the teen, teen reaction videos. So if you see that there's a, a specific uh, reaction persona and the performance the performance that everyone does in their reaction that is according to the genre and not necessarily to what people are expecting because people are already expecting what was defined as their reaction persona uh so i just wanted you to comment on that and uh thank you i was putting all the questions and if anyone else has comments please also um join in so i don't know if annika you want to start Yeah, um, I'm not sure if I again like followed all the nuances, but so you can like um, direct me if I start talking about things you think are irrelevant. But I think I, I was, um, um, I think for me, like the Pepsi advert is interesting because it's like a kind of precursor of um, of a kind of shift that happens in the in the promotion of artists like in the early 2000s which is the rise of like um 360 degree contracting um and so i don't know if like jackson when, when was that 83 yeah no he, he wouldn't have like um had this kind of contract probably but um that is this idea that like uh the 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 the, the record label um, becomes um, integrated into these like larger like entertainment corporations and and um, a result of that is like that the record label um, increasingly see artists as like vehicles um, to advertise like a wide and increasingly like broadening range of products so like the the Pepsi advert is like a good example of, of this um, um, and yet yeah, um and I suppose like the Super Bowl would also be like an, an excellent example of that also because it's like um the performance like operates on like several as like a kind of advert on like several different um levels um 
I can't remember what else you said. Um, but it was it was, it was interesting. Um, so, sorry, I mean, I was just now that you're thinking about that example, I don't know if you saw because um, a lot of people were talking about when the, the weekend did his uh, performance on the Super Bowl and the way they filmed their his performance, it was like up to 15 minutes. Each track that he played was an entire music video on its own. So even as, as a live performance, we could extract that performance to single music videos and to a whole mm -hmm. music video as this idea of artwork and adverts. So yeah. I don't know if this goes in this idea that you're talking about and this, if we can talk about commodified expectation of what is that, ad, um, that interval uh, bring to the audience. I don't know. The interval between the com the commodity and the and the advert. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't. I I I don't. I'm not familiar with that performance actually. Um, but yeah, I I I am familiar with this kind of idea of like, um, yeah, these like large like staging the where the perf where the relationship between the performance and the music video is like completely blurred so both things are kind of like take place that so, yeah that is that is a very interesting um i hadn't actually thought about that that's very interesting um hey thank you thanks hello so i i think i understood your question joanna you were talking about how in instagram the the host page who shares the video as some weight on the on the supposed relevance of the content is that uh, i'm i'm catching it yeah and, and like on youtube the the content creator has some also some weight because he has like a, a background that will make the information in this case more uh, an audiovisual essay more scholastic or more informative than in Instagram, which would be more artistic, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think so. It's obvious, like uh, taking the example of Pepsi, right? If Pepsi made a one minute video with opera, the, the range and the spectac spectacularity of the, of, the, of the people that would see and would like only because it's Pepsi. Sometimes it would be astronomers. It, yeah, yes. Yeah, as, I was just thinking you as a composer and uh, you and this idea of <laughs> if I mean, in YouTube, you have videos with like billions of views almost those, like how, how to compose a song in 10 minutes. And uh, it it's you know, shows this, and if you talked about a, bit, a little about that too. Yes, yes. And this idea of in YouTube, I can, if I want to have a more like avant-garde or this idea of a really classical uh, music in, in an elitist way of thinking, I'm not going to the videos of how to compose the song in 10 minutes, because that is a commodified way to present uh, uh, music uh, composing and not this idea of I'm trying to learn musical composition not in an elitist way, but I know that in order to reach the this idea of I can't compose an opera in 10 minutes, or I can, but I'm going to have a different ways to present that depending on who's producing. If someone who's producing is an actual, and I'm not saying that the people that in 10 minutes aren't composers, they are, but they have a very different way to regard music and music teaching. And it's not necessarily teach, teaching as just like showing this is a formula that will always work. And if you need to compose for either Hollywood or a game or a movie, this will work. And then if I go to Instagram and search for like uh, music for film, then you have this more artsy way to present uh, certain films with certain soundtracks and not everything is going to go there because even if it's mainstream, there's a more uh, appreciated and validated way to have, like, I don't know, um, let me think about a soundtrack for a really nice, you know, mainstream, but considered artsy film. And then you have a films that go on like Sunday afternoon that no one wants to watch, but everybody watches it, but they don't consider that as artsy. And then Instagram does this idea of presenting those essays, but then YouTube has everything. So just like you as a composer, how do you see that also in your own um, research? I don't know. 
kind of like kind of like how I navigate through those through all those information. Uh, well, I I watch and I listen, and I and in the end I I judge by by my by my background or by my how to put it by by my standards and uh, and you know as much as i watch one one content creator for example there will always be something connected to it that will bring me more content like that i don't know if i'm if i'm explaining mm -hmm. this yeah 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 it's like it's it's a chain you know you watch one and you like it and you search more about it or 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 if it talks about something that you that you're interested in or that i don't know it's it's almost as random as uh, as as going on instagram you see a story and you and you like it or not and you swipe or not i i, I don't know i don't know i understand yeah yeah You want me to answer about? Oh yeah, I... sure. Yeah, go. Yeah, Michael. Um, yeah, I think higher. I think it's very complicated because, uh, you know, one argument would be just the only hierarchy is really the number of subscribers or views or something like that, and that wouldn't necessarily go to the experts. You know, over the over the more intuitive reactors who come from completely different backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, musical backgrounds, and so forth. So yes, there are the kind of channels which are you know vocal coach reacts to or guitarist or producer etc or people with expertise within a certain genre or people like you know john again from artv has been you know reviewing stuff since he was 16 so he's kind of got quite good at it but it's interesting a lot of those review expert channels um they don't just sit there and give a review like a kind of in a sort of impassive way they also perform a lot of emotion as well they get furious about certain releases they get excited they you know almost throw things across the room you know it's like it's like they wouldn't be popular without the emotional effective component and i think some people really like reviewers who don't have expertise who don't have prior knowledge who experience you know the sense of somebody experiencing something that's for them different and for the first time is like you know is like really interesting and attractive uh as well and can lead to a lot of you know uh subscription. So more authentic like this is more authentic and more um genuine because this is not a, an expert person so this is just like the feeling and the 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 yeah, sponsor, it creates you know. a different kind of relationship, I think, between the reactor yeah. and the subscribers. So it is quite kind of uh, varied, which is not to say that they're aren't higher. Right? But one thing I'd also like to say is that the whole thing is really, oh, yeah, and I also want to point to, you know, obviously there are some quite strange reactors as well who probably don't get so many subscribers, but it's just like, let's say, two teenagers in a car getting stoned like you know forgetting what they're even reacting to or, or something or and there's a guy even like this guy mr video who's in his 40s or whatever uh he, he's like smoking all the time and just you know the meme react and quite continue the reaction often so you know obviously there's there's levels of professionalism that are quite variable and some of the you know i guess emotional reactors are pretty professional in terms of you know and sometimes it'll be like jay uses music that comes from her her brother who's kind of like hip-hop producer or something has very impressive kind of graphics and stuff which all relates to the things that she's kind of selling which also relates to the things that she says and it's all kind of quite worked out and integrated in some ways but then there'll be moments which are just pure you know performance of you know having strong authentic feelings in response to something that she'd never heard before whereas other people it's much simpler on those on those levels but everybody brings in kind of different elements really and i think it's kind of what makes it so uh so, so fascinating in a sense because it's all about you know how do you create a sort of you know environment that is kind of like a works for both reactors and the and the subscribers so you know they will approach it kind of differently and some for some people it's more like a kind of a fun party type atmosphere and for others it's more like you know they're kind of more serious about what they're you know trying to actually sort of understand and interpret certain things even if it's done largely intuitively etc or if it's done through a kind of a you know a sort of a, a reading of the lyrics which you know and some then subscribers might deliberately choose something like i'm a loser by beck where you can't 
possibly make any sense of the lyrics, but they know that this reactor is going to try. So it's kind of it's an interesting sort of negotiation around all sorts of different levels of of you know of of expertise and and you know skills and 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 so forth. But it, but what I find interesting is when the actual kind of listening and responsiveness sort of becomes you know becomes the skill because I think that that's kind of interesting. True, almost this idea of illiteracy that people are gaining and almost a, a certain set of skills that I that I uh, start to to gather while listening and watching and even trying to stimulate reaction videos. I don't know. And if people also share that in other forums, I mean, Reddit, uh, people like commenting on reaction videos and thinking I can learn something with this, even if it's in a more comic way i don't know uh or not I, I wanted... educational as a sense but also this idea of i'm trying to learn something taking up from this reaction video i don't know and there's an effective relationship from their own effective labor i think yeah but i think two other things are there's a collective intelligence at work as well because the reactors will yeah. ask subscribers for things that they don't know and you know we kind of the information will be sort of pulled together, but there's also this kind of intuitive intelligence where sometimes, you know, and, the, and also reactors obviously come from very different backgrounds, like not just in terms of race, but also class and that kind of thing. Um, you know, some of them are pretty middle class, but you know, and you don't always know, but you kind of get a sense that, you know, reactors are coming from very different kinds of, uh, but sometimes these sort of intuitive kind of ways of responding to and thinking about listening can be almost come up to a like, you know, I would say there's moments of some reaction videos, we almost get a kind of a, a sort of a theory of listening coming out or, you know, sort of certain ways of thinking about how things like YouTube work uh, and so forth. And and also underlying all of that, of course, is uh, which maybe relates to several of the papers is, uh, you know, democratization of certain kind of, um, you know, you know, the technical ability to make these kinds of things because they're not actually, 100% easy, but they are, you know, they're, they're with a certain basic literacy and digital skills, you can create stuff like that. And I think that applies to audiovisual essays as well, because obviously people made essay films like in the 60s or whenever, but only a few people, you know, who were sort of, you know, uh, skilled filmmakers, etc., who could get access to the material, who could edit them, who could whatever. Whereas now, you know, that is a kind of a more, more shared distributed kind of skill sets, even if they don't, um, obviously not everybody can do them necessarily. So I think that's also really, that kind of democratization also allows certain voices to, you know, gain a certain kind of resonance that would not have been possible uh, previous to these kinds of platforms. Totally, yeah. And thank you for, for explaining that and giving more thought into it. And I know we have to uh, end this as it's already five, but Paula just asked a small question, Michael, to you in the chat, the methodological, and how do you approach the viewers' reactions beyond the comments? Have you ever interviewed a viewer? Did you make any participant observation? Um, well, this is all kind of fairly new. So, um, and I guess, you know, you can find out a certain amount about the viewers from the just the kinds of comments uh, and so forth that they leave. So I've more kind of observed observed that, uh, but I was sort of more focused on you know the reactors themselves and what they what what they were doing, uh, and you know obviously that also involves the viewers as well because you know you get the kind of they're responding to the viewers and what they what what they react to and how they react and then that also gets responded to etc so it's a kind of a whole circuit uh it's also you know a, an economic circuit as well uh but um yeah you can get quite a bit of that you know from uh, you could you could go into more detail analyzing the different kinds of you know kinds of comments mm -hmm. for different sorts of uh channels um and so forth but yeah i mean there's a whole you know huge areas that that could be researched and that i think have not been researched that much yeah. I think it's really very, very interesting the, the the possibility of knowing better also the the, um, the viewers uh, to know who are them, and um, it, it it's interesting because we are really in the a fairly new world, 
and uh, we have to to invent to to create uh, methods to um, to investigate these these questions also uh, i confront myself with, with these questions so <laughs> i was also asking you thank you so much thanks okay so i think we can't continue this because it's already five 502 and I know there's a panel in less than an hour so I think we have to end this uh, session um, so yeah thank you again uh, to all the, our three wonderful panelists it was really really interesting um, to our coordinators of this of this uh, work group Paula and João and to everyone who was here uh, attending and asking questions and comments thank you all and so yeah this work group will have another session at six uh, it is about music um and video games i think um so yeah so if you want please show up and um and yeah thank you so much again and have a great uh day of conference and thank you thank you very much thank you see you thank soon. you yeah, see you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Have, have fun with the playlist if you copy the yeah. link. Yeah, <laughs> we will. Oh, yeah. <laughs>